Okay, could I have your attention, please? We'd like to get started again. Uh, so our next speaker is Joseph Bassignano Riera, uh, who is a professor at the Virginia Bioinformatics Institute and in the Department of Biomedical Sciences and Pathobiology here at Virginia Tech. He's already talked to you before. You've seen him. You've heard from some of his students. Uh, so you're somewhat familiar with him, but just briefly, he is the director of the Modeling Im Immunity to Impaired Pathogens, or MEEP, uh, project. Uh, his background, he's got a DBM from the University of Barcelona. That really began our connection, I guess, as he brought uh, Adri and, and Monica over. Uh, and uh, his PhD is in nutrition and immunology from Iowa State University. He's been at Virginia Tech a little over 10 years, rising through the ranks to his current position. Uh, has a variety of research interests, including things like computational immunology, nutritional immunology. Uh, and so today, what he's going to be talking about is connecting data. Thank you, Dave. And uh, thanks, Madhav, for uh, setting the stage for, for my talk. Uh, as Madhav was saying, this is really an integrated effort uh, between several groups at the Virginia Bioinformatics Institute. Uh, it's very interesting. I, I find it uh, very exciting that Kate uh, joined us for this education activity since she was very critical to get the, the project started. Now, it's, it's interesting, we've prepared the presentations independently, and one of the slides that Madhav used, I'm, I, I'm also going to use the first model that, that we developed with Kate, which, by the way, was not related to infectious disease, uh, the main focus of modeling immunity to enteric pathogens. The focus at that time was inflammatory bowel disease. And what that shows us is, uh, and, and I'll allude to that later, the, the portability and, and the way we are designing these models in, in a way that the, they don't become a, a one-show pony, uh, that we can move uh, from, from one infectious disease to another with uh, perhaps some minor changes in, in the topology, uh, with uh, recalibration of data sets, and I'll show uh, probably two use cases today, if, if we have time, I'll, I'll touch on, on the third one, um, as to how we have recalibrated models that you've seen uh, throughout the week uh, to answer uh, different questions. Uh, before we do that, I know that uh, Dr. Allen spent a lot of time describing uh, what the mucosal immune system is about. Of course, his focus was mainly on epithelial and, um, and myeloid cells, but I wanted to reiterate because that's the basis of how we are constructing our models, at least our tissue level models. Um, what are the key components of the mucosal immune system? And, and Andre alluded to, to the, those two compartments in his uh, presentation, and you've seen those compartments embedded in the different SBML networks that we've shown throughout the week. We have the inductive sites where the immune responses are initiated, and in here, uh, you can see that uh, we have the um, Payer patches as one of the inductive sites represented, uh, the lamina propria as uh, one of the effector sites. So the inductive sites is where the immune responses are initiated. The effector sites are where the immune responses take place. And, and so for instance, uh, in this representation, we have the colonic lamina propria, uh, which is uh, covered by a, a monolayer of epithelial cells. And um, Dr. Allen discussed the turnover of these epithelial cells and the importance of this turnover uh, in the context of infection or just homeostasis. And under this epithelial cell monolayer, we have the immune cells, uh, regulatory T cells, Th1, Th2, Th17. We saw the presentation um, from uh, Dr. Youssef uh, earlier this week, uh, focusing on uh, the beautiful work on Th17 differentiation. Obviously, that network uh, that he reproduced would be embedded within this cell, which in turn is embedded uh, within that colonic lamina propria or gastric lamina propria if we are exploring uh, H. pylori infection. And what that shows is that uh, there's an integration of, of, across the scales uh, that is important from a temporal perspective, is important um, from a spatial perspective. And uh, inductive sites and effector sites are connected. Uh, we have cells that are being uh, activated or where there's an antigen presentation in the payer patches traveling to the mesenteric lymph nodes uh, through the thoracic duct, uh, accessing the bloodstream, and um, uh, being uh, then uh, or migrating to the lamina propria uh, to fight against um, viruses, bacteria, or to help maintain uh, homeostasis. Uh, the 
mucosal immune system represents about 70% of the immune system in humans. It's a very significant part of the overall immune system. There's about uh, 300 square meters of epithelium in our uh, mucosal immune system. It's an impressive. Uh, we could pave several tennis courts with uh, that uh, epithelium. And we are replenishing that immune system on a daily or every two day basis. So uh, those are some numbers, some food for thought. Of course, if we include the microbiota, with, where we have trillions of bacteria at the more distal stages of the mucosal immune system, it becomes an extremely complex system where reductionist approaches have, can get only that far in comprehending function and comprehending uh, phenotype. And so our laboratory has been working in the interface of uh, genes, microbiome, diet, inflammation, and immunity uh, over the last uh, 12, uh, 15 years. Uh, our lab is called Nutritional Immunology and Molecular Medicine. And the nutritional, nutritional immunology focus is represented by the interface between diet and inflammation. And just understanding that interface is extremely complex. And we soon came to the realization that if we were going to continue studying that relationship in a very uh, specific way, slicing the problem so thin, then the problem was going to become meaningless. And I think it was in that context that we uh, started to interact with uh, NDSSL, uh, with Kate and others to try to understand uh, immune responses in a more systems level not only at the gene expression level, but also at the cellular level and at the tissue level. And we started to build those more comprehensive uh, computational and mathematical models of uh, the mucosal immune system. And uh, I, I wanted, uh, before I get to the, the, the specifics of today's talk, because I think it's relevant to remember what this uh, modeling mucosal immunity summer school and symposium is about. We, we are at the last day of the summer school. Tomorrow we have the symposium ahead. In that context, we, we designed this um, education component to introduce immunologists to the latest methods and tools for using compu uh, computational modeling. We wanted to present the MIP and MIB work to the wider audience and wanted to disseminate those computational models of the gut mucosal immune system. And I hope we've made some progress in this regard. Um, what have you learned so far? I hope that you have had a sense uh, of uh, what the mucosal immune responses are. I know the majority of you, by design, have an immunology training. I'm aware that there are some of you that have a more computational uh, science background. And so we've tried to tailor this summer school towards the uh, starting immunologies that may be interested in modeling, that may see value in the modeling approaches, that may see value in this integrated cycle of calibrating models, uh, hypothesis generation, validating uh, those predictions in the lab. And uh, I hope that our models uh, highlighted the, the architecture of the mucosal immune system and I was, as I was showing in my earlier slide, the inductive and the effector sides. If you think about the model that Adri presented of uh, H. pylori infection, uh, there were several compartments, and I'll show that picture again. There was the lumen, the epithelium, the lamina propria, and the gastric lymph node. So the gastric lymph nodes in that context would be an inductive site. The lamina propria would be an effector site. And so we've also talked about types of computational models uh, of the mucosal immune system and tools. Uh, we've been using ODE models. We've been using agent-based models. We've integrated those models. We are making um, good progress. I hope that we'll have a multi-scale modeling paper as a proof of concept within the next month of, or so. And as Madhav said, there's a long way we need to go. We, uh, that will be a, a, an initial proof of concept. We'll have to work very hard to get that uh, platform and that model to the next level. Um, we've um, also showed you how to build network models from data and theory. And I'll allude to that later. I, I agree with Madhav that uh, you don't necessarily need data uh, to build a model. In all our cases, we've used data. But what we haven't done is to forget about the theoretical framework. So we've integrated the theoretical components, the theory, with the data-driven uh, components. And some of the models and use cases are more data-driven, some are more theoretical,
but it is within the combination and the interface, and our tools take that into account, integrating data and theory to make predictions. And not to make predictions that are um, academic exercises, we are not in the business of uh, running academic exercises, at least that's what I've been pushing the center. We are in the business of trying to solve problems, problems related to human medicine. And so we hope uh, that there's a translational value and we hope that our models will help advance development of new therapeutics and, uh, and vaccines. We've also alluded to mining immunological data sets using Cytobank or IPA. Uh, there was a talk about signaling regulatory networks and, and the models. And uh, the tools that uh, have been covered in some detail have been uh, COPASI and EC cell designer. And within these, and particularly under COPASI, we've touched on calibration, sensitivity analysis, parameter estimation, simulation, model-driven hypothesis generation, and experimental validation. And uh, what we are doing under MIT is to build models that are portable and comply with standards, uh, systems biology markup language for our ODE models. Uh, the models of the immune system are applicable to infectious and immune mediated diseases. And, and as I said, the first model that Kate constructed was actually an IBD model. Uh, it, it was designed to understand the underlying changes occurring in, in the context of uh, inflammatory bowel disease. And he used data from a peak model of inflammatory bowel disease to calibrate uh, that computational models. We hope that the models, or some aspects of them at least, can be recycled for new uses following recalibration uh, with new data sets. And I'll show you an example as to how we've recycled the CD4 model that I represented on Monday. And we recalibrated that CD4 model with a data set specific to um, an IL-21 uh, knockout project in the context of H. pylori infection to come up with a different uh, or a new set of predictions that were then validated experimentally. And we are combining theoretical and data-driven approaches uh, and, and we are integrating data sets and exploring conflicting results in silico. This is the slide that Madaf presented and, and that I uh, decided to present to, to show the legacy of uh, how the story started, that, that was the first model of the, lumina, uh, the lumen, lamina propria, and mesenteric lymph nodes showing the interactions uh, in the context of inflammatory bowel disease. And, uh, and we hope to continue to develop this model further, uh, not under this program, but uh, probably uh, through other uh, programs. And, and that, that may seem out of context, but I, I have a question for you. I wanted to ask, what, what do you think there is in common uh, in, in this context between uh, the Chicago Daily Tribune and Google. And uh, what, uh, why would I even bring this up uh, today? And anyone has a guess of what may have happened here? So, and, and the Chicago Tribune article <laughs> states, Dewey defeats Truman. And I can say that it's a 1948 picture. <clears throat> Did you all get what's predicted? Is that what you're I think that's that's the point. Uh, in 1948, uh, the Chicago Tribune predicted, based on inaccurate polls, that uh, Truman was not going to win the election. Actually, Truman had very low levels of popularity after the war, and uh, and he didn't do very well. So there was an announcement, and they printed the newspaper saying. Dewey was going to be the new president of the United States. And Truman was very happy to show that the next day when it was demonstrated that he in fact had won the election. Now, why is Google next to this picture? Maybe their flu vaccine uh, prediction? Exactly. Mm -hmm. So uh, Google made a big deal uh, about the, their system to predict flu vaccine vaccine and flu infection outbreaks. Um, and uh, this year, it has been confirmed that they, it was not so good. Uh, in fact, uh, they were not able to predict the 2009 swan outbreak, even though this tool was already available. And their data doesn't seem to match very well the, the CDC. And so what we have here is that Google algorithms overestimated uh, peak flu levels uh, last year. 
and they didn't do a very good job uh, in previous years. And uh, the, I'm, I'm saying this, and I'm bringing this up, even though we are not uh, in the business under this program of uh, studying flu outbreaks, because one of the reasons Google made the mistake was that they um, used the data, but they didn't consider the underlying theoretical framework. And, uh, and so that would be an example in which data-driven approaches alone can uh, result in, uh, in big problems. So what we want to do is to build uh, complementary strategies. Big data is great, and I think I'm not saying let's not use big data. I'm saying let's use big data not as a substitute for traditional data. Let's use that big data as a complement uh, for traditional data. And there's a need for validating and, and integrating those data sets. And the modeling platforms that we are developing underneath provide an opportunity to integrate those theoretical frameworks as well as uh, the data that is generated through flow cytometry, uh, mass cytometry, maybe it's an ELISA data set, uh, maybe it's a real-time PCR data set, or maybe they are histology pictures or clinical outcome results. We hope to be able to integrate those data sets with RNA-seq and uh, high throughput uh, kind of uh, results. And we've, uh, we are doing this by integrating the uh, knowledge from the literature, integrating the results uh, from our own laboratory and other laboratories, and building those models, running the simulations. And eventually, uh, and that was the first visualization, which I recognize is not very good, of lesions uh, formed in the gastric uh, not in appropriate following H. pylori infection. Now we've, uh, we have better visualizations. And so I'll get to my use cases now. Uh, Adri alluded to uh, the paradox of H. pylori. Is H. pylori a pathogen? Is H. pylori a beneficial organism? We know H. pylori is a bacterium, and there is no question about that. Uh, another fact is H. pylori was classified as a type 1 carcinogen uh, by the World Health Organization. And the approach that has been used uh, to dealing with H. pylori based on uh, NIH recommendations has been eradication. And in fact, uh, many of the people in this room don't have H. pylori because the, the the mechanism most doctors use when H. pylori is detected is get, let's get rid of it. Now, if we go to uh, developing countries, the rates are going to be higher. Now, uh, Martin Blazer at New York University uh, has uh, defined H. pylori as one of the most endangered species uh, in our planet. And, and he has made the point that uh, perhaps uh, when we realize that H. pylori is needed, it might be too late. And the rationale for this is that there is an inverse correlation between H. pylori prevalence and the rate of overweight and obesity. And as we alluded to a study that we conducted in mice uh, showing that H. pylori uh, colonization ameliorates glucose homeostasis uh, through a P. bar gamma dependent mechanism. So H. pylori, particularly attack a negative strain of H. pylori, exerted uh, beneficial effects. And, um, and so obviously, H. pylori is, has some very detrimental effects uh, linked to gastric cancer, lymphoma, and has some potential beneficial effects. And, and so what's going on? How do we understand this complex relationship between the host and the bacterium? And you saw this slide from Andre's presentation. And uh, he made the case that um, through his modeling, through his integrated modeling and experimental approaches, that uh, perhaps treating H. pylori infection based on the results we have today might not be the best approach uh, because H. pylori is only part of the problem. Uh, we may eliminate H. pylori, but H. pylori is inducing an immune, immune response, TH1, TH17 uh, uh, response that may be involved in, in the lesion formation. And so uh, can we modulate the uh, host response underneath H. pylori infection uh, rather than treating H. pylori itself, given that H. pylori is obviously exerting some beneficial effects? And the beneficial effects of H. pylori in the context of type 2 diabetes and obesity are linked at least to regulation of hormones produced by the stomach that regulate society, uh, ghrelin, uh, leptin, 
And, uh, and as a result, uh, when edge point law is not there, people tend to be less capable of uh, regulating glucose homeostasis. They have uh, to eat uh, more. So, um, but in the context of edge pylori infections, uh, we know that there's a significant influx of CD40 cells. Uh, cytokine sense restriction factors activated in CD40 cells are crucial to modulate myeloid cells, and there was there's a secondary myeloid cell influx. And so, how can we target this uh, immune response uh, to edge pylori? And we believe a potential is to develop post-targeted therapeutic approaches. Um, you also will remember this slide that was shown by uh, Stephen and uh, Audrey. Uh, those are simulation results uh, of an EC, uh, the agent-based modeling platform, showing that following H. pylori infection, we are inducing at about, after 30 days post-infection, we are in inducing TH1, TH17, and there's a parallel induction of, of TREG. Uh, so, um, IL-21 is quite critical in the modulation of both TH17 and TH1 subsets. IL-21 helps in the maintenance of uh, TH17 cells and infers uh, TREG homeostasis by IL-2 inhibition. Uh, IL-21, we've shown, is increased with H. pylori infection and correlates with level of gastritis, at least in the mouse model. So uh, we have this network. Adri um, calibrated this network. He published this paper in PLOS Computational Biology. And uh, the focus of that initial publication was the validation of a prediction between the plasticity of regulatory T cells and TH17 cells modulated by the transcription factor P bar gamma. He used this network to then um, focus on uh, IL-21, and he recalibrated the data set with IL-21 as specific data to explore how the sensitivities change within the system following uh, modulation of IL-21. And so this uh, shows basically that uh, we had calibrated the model initially for the publication of 2013. We recalibrated this model again with a data set from CD40 cells extracted from H. pylori infected mice, and we had well-type mice and IL-21 uh, knockout mice. And uh, what the data shows is, as expected, uh, that uh, IL-21 deletion causes, uh, uh, has the mice lacking IL-21 have lower levels of IL-17 and lower levels of interferon gamma when compared to the well-type mice following infection with Helicobacter pylori. And so we use this data to recalibrate the model and to calibrate specifically the reactions uh, that are related to IL-21. We run a sensitivity analysis to assess how sensitive are different molecules to the change in concentration of IL-21 following H. pylori infection. And uh, we found that IL-21 activation is positively correlated with TH1 and TH17. So our in silico system was capable of regulating what was known, uh, the theory. That was as a uh, quality control, if you wish, of our modeling approach. And then uh, we began to uh, examine other uh, transcription factors. We looked at STAT1, STAT3, ROR gamma C, uh, TBX21. And uh, our exper experimental data was uh, matching the uh, computational uh, or simulation data. And what we found interesting was that IL-21 uh, did not modulate FOXP3 expression during H. pylori infection. However, uh, IL-21 had a significant uh, impact on the IL-10 response by TH17 cells. In other words, our uh, model predicted that IL-10 would be uh, upregulated in the IL-21 knockout system, but there would be no differences in fox 3 We then run a follow-up experiment to validate this data, and um, um, fox 3 was not changed, at least not statistically, is the graph on the left. On the right, uh, we have um, a significant difference between wild type and IL-21 knockout mice in terms of increased IL-10 production. So uh, the deficiency of IL-21 in the context of H. pylori infection is inducing a regulatory, an anti-inflammatory um, 
size of country. And uh, this slide shows the, how close our experimental and predictive data was at the end of the experiment. And um, the question is, can we find a better, more targeted approach to reduce the inflammatory response triggered by H. pylori? Um, and uh, our data seems to suggest that IL-21 may be part of the story. Uh, this is uh, HNE staining of stomachs from H. pylori infected mice. On the right, we have wild type mice. On the left, we have IL-21 deficient mice. And as you can see, in the, if, if you know how to read those histopathology slides, there's significant infiltration or leukocytic infiltration, uh, a slightly enhanced uh, mucosal thickness in the slide from wild type mice, whereas the, uh, a slide from IL-10 knockout mice, the mice lacking, I, I, sorry, IL-21 knockout mice, the mice lacking IL-21, and those are whole body knockouts, the leukocytic infiltration was significantly uh, reduced and uh, the top uh, figure shows uh, the, the significant difference um, when comparing IL-21 negative and IL-21 positives. IL-21 is expressed at very low concentrations in the gastric mucosa following H. pylori infection, but it seems like even those very small concentrations of IL-21 have a major impact in modulating TH17 and interferon gamma and in the infiltration of uh, leukocyte subsets. So we are now looking at the um, uh, molecule, and, and we've not made, uh, we don't have the definitive answer yet, but um, actually Pfizer develop, is developing um, a compound, uh, a small molecule, for treating IBD. Obviously, IL-21 has been um, uh, a target, a therapeutic target for inflammatory bowel disease, an immune-mediated disease. Uh, we are um, going to look into uh, how this small molecule, what are the, the beneficial effects or neutral effects or negative effects of uh, blocking IL-21 in the context of HP infection. If our model is correct, we should see that blocking IL-21 to this pharmacological approach uh, eliminates lesion formation in the stomach. So this is a working process. I'm going to move now to the second use case, which also builds on uh, previous uh, presentations that happened earlier in the week. This is the model, uh, the tissue level model of H. pylori infection. It represents the uh, lumen on top, uh, the epithelial barrier, um, the lamina propria, and the uh, uh, gastric lymph nodes. So the effector sites and the inductive sites. And you saw this slide from Adri showing the sensitivity analysis by using COPASI approaches on the right, and easy approaches on the left, indicating that at the initial stages of uh, infection, the bacterium contributes to epithelial cell damage. At later stages of infection, when the infection becomes chronic in the mouse model, it is the TH17 and TH1 subset that contribute to that uh, lesion formation, at least the epithelial uh, lesion formation. And uh, in that model, we ask the question, what's going to happen if, if we delete uh, PIPAR gamma? And uh, that actually is work that Kate uh, initiated when she transitioned from uh, the IBD model to the HP model. And uh, I will not get into A, B, C, D, and F, but what I wanted you to, show, to, to take a look at is the prediction in terms of H pylori loads uh, in well type versus uh, myeloid-specific PIPAR gamma null mice. Basically, what the model predicts is that uh, the levels of H. pylori in the lumen will be greater uh, at the chronic stages of infection than in tissue-specific PIPAR gamma uh, null mice. We've also looked at, uh, if that's the case, is this effect mediated through the epithelial uh, compartment, or is this mediated through a myeloid cell related mechanism. So the epithelial compartment would be the top and is marked as one in uh, subpanel B. And the myeloid related <coughs> mechanism is in the lamina propria and is marked as two. And if you look at the results of the simulation, actually, if we infect with H. pylori well type or uh, myeloid specific uh, PIPAR gamma null mice, uh, we see that there's actually more uh, in the um, more H. pylori. So that's different than, than the previous prediction. But if we infect uh, and look at the M1 macrophage differentiations, 
we see that h pylori has a pattern similar to what we had uh, observed in, in the whole model. So we advanced uh, experimentally, and we looked uh, in mice that were uninfected, the left panel, the middle panel is infected, wild-type mice, and the right panel is infected, myeloid-specific pipar gamma deficient mice. And what we are seeing is that the myeloid-specific pipar gamma deficient mice have increased lesions, increased leukocytic infiltration, uh, increased mucosal thickening in the stomach, uh, following H. pylori infection. And uh, linked to the prediction that I was pointing out earlier, if we follow the bacterial loads, uh, the amount of H. pylori in the stomachs of mice, and we followed this for over six months, we were uh, killing uh, subsets of mice uh, serially, the uh, prediction uh, was uh, holding true. The wild type mice had higher loads, the P. gamma specific uh, in myeloid cell had uh, lower loads of H. pylori. And if we look at, uh, at those macrophages, there's clearly H. pylori in the uh, cytosol um, of the cell. And so we then run studies. Uh, the previous slide is in vivo. We run co-culture studies with uh, macrophages from well-type and tissue-specific pipar gamma null mice. And the pattern uh, was the same. The orange line represents um, H. pylori loads in wild-type mice co-cultured with H. pylori strain SS1. Uh, the lysozyme uh, mice or tissue-specific or myeloid-specific pipar gamma null mice is in blue. And, uh, and so both at in vivo level as well as in co-culture studies, the deficiency of pipar gamma in myeloid cells resulted in lower levels of H. pylori. And this was correlated with increased levels of INOS in the uh, tissue-specific P. bar gamma uh, null mice. So we are still in the process of going back and forth uh, with our um, model, tissue level model, and uh, our experimental validations. And we decided to use, and now you are probably familiar with several aspects of this pipeline, we decided to go to the big data. Uh, we decided to uh, uh, run some RNA-seq analysis to understand what was going on, why the deficiency of pipar gamma in macrophages resulted in lower levels of H. pylori. What's the immunological mechanism underlying that phenomenon? So basically we run uh, uh, a co-culture study and then we collected uh, RNA from those macrophages at uh, different time points. And we run this through the Galaxy pipeline. I know that you didn't do in-depth work with Galaxy, but you at least have been exposed. You know that there's about uh, 50 local instances in the country. We have a local instance here that we use for our RNA-seq analysis. And, um, and uh, this is available to you if you want to use. There are other um, uh, very user-friendly um, graphic user interface-based systems to do RNA-seq analysis. But, uh, the, the analysis of, of that data was then uh, done, at least the network inference component, through Ingenuity Pathway, and Kate did uh, a, a good job uh, yesterday presenting the capabilities uh, of that tool. And, but the, the end result of the IPA analysis is a static network. We don't have the dynamics embedded. So we have the, the roads, but we don't have the traffic going through those roads. And so what we want to do, and I'll show you step by step uh, the, the network that we build, was not only to create that static network, but to build a mathematical model from that static network so that we could assess the sensitivities of at least some of the key players that we believe may play a role in modulating um, responses to H. pylori macrophages. So um, one of the um, top uh, networks that came up as regulated by responses to H. pylori was not actually uh, an immune-related uh, pathway, was a pathway related to metabolism. And, uh, and so you may be familiar with the complex 1 through 5 uh, oxidative phosphorylation proteins. They are embedded within the inner membrane of the mitochondria, and they are involved in producing energy. And what we found is that following H. pylori infection at different time points, uh, there was an upregulation of genes 
uh, link to mitochondrial dysfunction and oxidative phosphorylation. We also examine other components of the network uh, that have to do with innate immune responses and that may intersect uh, metabolism-related pathways. Uh, we saw that uh, some of the differentially expressed genes are the TLRs. Uh, Dr. Allen discussed uh, TLRs, discussed NLRs. We had an NLR uh, cluster also differentially expressed, NLRP3 upregulated. Uh, NLRP3 was described uh, yesterday as an, um, an inflammasome forming NLR, whereas NLRX1 was described as a regulatory or anti-inflammatory NLR. And uh, what we see is the NF-kappa B pathway uh, related genes are regulated, TRAF2, TRAF6, IRF7, STAT1 were differentially expressed, and then a series of cytokines, IL-1, DNF, IL-1, um, IL-6, IL-1 alpha and beta were upregulated. And this also <coughs> was represented over time. We have six time points. I'm showing two time points uh, here. And that information uh, we are using then. So those are static networks. And, and so here we have how things interact. We don't have uh, the dynamics that underlie that interaction. So from this static network, we then want to build a computational and mathematical model. And we are using ordinary differential equations and COPACI to build that uh, computational and mathematical model to facilitate this uh, uh, going from the static network to the model. We've built uh, a plugin that uh, minimizes the work. Cassie Washington is working on, on this uh, model. If we look at the fitting, our model was able to fit uh, the experimental data uh, well enough. Uh, there was a discussion about fitting, uh, and that there was a common uh, from Adri at about 5% difference from experimental and computationally generated data. And uh, then we ran a sensitivity analysis in the context of this model. Uh, we looked at the local sensitivity for NLRX1. And what we are seeing is that um, there is a, a relationship between NLRX1 and the kinds of molecules that would be involved in viral signaling uh, cascades. Of course, H. pylori is not a virus. Uh, but nonetheless, the, the, the pathways that are being upregulated are viral signaling. So we would expect those pathways in the context of influenza infection, for instance. Um, we also see NLRX1 and interferon gamma signaling. That, that there is an intimate relationship uh, within our model. And the sensitivity suggests that there may be a role for NLRX1 in MXC class 1 signaling as well. So what the interpretation of this is that um, H. pylori has been viewed uh, for decades as an extracellular bacterium. Now we have evidence that uh, H. pylori can be found inside epithelial cells, can be found inside macrophages. And what this is beginning to point out, and it's a work in progress in its uh, further development, is the potential for H. pylori to present not only through an MHC class II related mechanism, and uh, all the CD4 work that we've done would allude to that CD4 related response, which had, would have been presented through MHC class II, but also through an MHC class I related mechanism. And, uh, and, and so if we look at NLRX1 expression and validation in macrophages, we see that um, when we compare wild type and uh, PPAR gamma null macrophages, there's a difference in terms of NLRX1 expression. Uh, That's the validation uh, by real-time PCR of RNA-seq data. And uh, if we uh, utilize NLRX1 knockout mice, we see that the deficiency of NLRX1 results in lower recovery of H. pylori from stomach uh, following three weeks of infection. And now we are running longer studies because we are interested in the chronic stages of infection. And uh, if we look at bone marrow derived macrophages, the data represents well what we are seeing in vivo. So the modeling is pointing at new directions and, and new areas of exploration mechanistically in the context of mouse models. Now, I alluded to the MHC class 1 versus MHC class 2 uh, presentation um, of uh, H. pylori, and uh, we've been trying to induce CD8 responses. So if, if there's presentation, if H. pylori is cytosolic, 
And if there is presentation through MHC plus one, we should see not only TH1 responses and TH17, we should see CD8 responses. We've had a hard time in using CD8 responses, the kinds of responses you would expect uh, in the context of influenza infection in uh, the mouse model. So we've developed a pig model. Pigs are very similar anatomically, physiologically, immunologically to humans. And, uh, and so we've developed in the context of this program a pig model of H. pylori infection. It's one of the first models developed. And this slide is showing how the um, gastric mucosa looks following H. pylori infection. As you can see here in this immunohistochemistry in panel A, H. pylori for the most part in the pig's stomach, and it would be similar in the mouse's stomach and the human stomach, is free-floating in the uh, mucus layer. Uh, Dr. Allen talked about the importance of the mucus layer as a means of protecting against infectious agents. And so most of the H. pylori can be found there. At the higher magnification, all these brown particles are H. pylori particles. Now, some of the H. pylori we find within myeloid cells inside, uh, and this is in vivo, extracted from uh, pig stomach. So there's uh, H. pylori inside myeloid cells. Those could be macrophages, could be the dendritic cells. If we look at the immune responses to H. pylori following 49 days of infection, in pigs, we're able to uh, find an increase of uh, CD8 uh, responses at about 28, 35 days post-infection. And this increase in CD8 responses associated with H. pylori infection was correlated with increased expression of granzyme A, granzyme B, and perforin. Uh, those would be the molecules uh, linked to cytotoxic activity of these CD8 positive T cells. So we are starting to build a case for H. pylori not only being an extracellular bacterium, but also being intracellular and inducing the kinds of responses that one would expect in an intracellular uh, contents and this again is an, an evolving story. So what will be the next steps for this uh, use case? Uh, we've run some local sensitivities, we'll be running some global sensitivity analysis. Uh, we've I've shown you data for NLRX1, we'll run data for NLRP3, NLRC5, which by the way is linked to uh, MNC class 1 presentation and was upregulated in that data set, uh, not one. We'll generate additional in silico knockouts um, and we'll integrate this gene expression model with the tissue level model by using the multi-scale modeling platform that uh, Dr. Marate was alluding to uh, earlier. And so um, that, uh, that presentation, I hope, helps uh, integrate uh, the concept, uh, the biological components of the program, at least the key biological uh, components with uh, the uh, multi-scale modeling uh, discussion that will take place in the round table. We hope that the discussion is going to be very interactive, so uh, we don't have uh, a series of uh, slides prepared for that uh, talk. We hope that uh, enough um, questions will be raised and enough uh, issues and uh, concerns, uh, uh, discussion of advantages of multi-scale modeling limitation will surface that we'll be able to uh, add some value and hopefully synergistically think about how to improve uh, the multi-scale modeling um, uh, and take it uh, to the next level. Really, the, the modeling immunity to take pathogens program, and I think this is applicable to uh, all four programs under modeling immunity for biodefense, is, is a program that is at the cutting edge of experimentation, but each problem is a hard research problem. We are, um, we are solving hard computational problems, we are solving hard, hard mathematical problems, and we try to integrate them on a day-to-day -day basis. This is the acknowledgement slide for the MIP team, but I wanted to also take uh, the time, and I'll, I'll show this slide again in the, uh, in the symposium. Those people have been working behind the scenes very hard to make possible the education component of MIP. And some people you've met, some people you may not have met, but I know they've been working uh, very hard. Uh, Kim Markowski, um, Adri, uh, Dave Evan, Jim Walk, uh, Kathy was involved actually in the preparation stages of this uh, of the summer school. Uh, Rachel Robinson prepared some visuals, a nice video that was circulated. Uh, Tracy, Tiffany, uh, Chris has been videotaping, uh, Ivan has been taking pictures, and Josh has helped you with the IT aspect. So with that said, I'll be glad to entertain any questions. Thank you.
Yeah, so that, that, was, that was great. For the, for the IL, um, in the IL-21 knockout experiments, what, well, one quick question. Was IL-21 in the model before those experiments? Was it, or, or, I know you said you recalibrated it. Was it already in the model, though? It was part of the topology okay. of the model. But the calibration data set that was used was not a, a, a data set that was really uh, comparing wild type versus IL-21 knockout. So there may have been some IL-21 data in the wild type system, yeah. but we didn't have a situation in which what happens when we take IL-21 out of the system. Before you recalibrated it, was there any uh, hint that an IL-21 knockout would have? such an effect from your from its silico experiment? Here? Well, the reason we, we decided to focus on IL-21 was because of the consistent, at least in, in mouse models, uh, increase in TH1 and TH17. And so we wanted to go deeper as to what may have been modulating uh, TH1 and TH17. IL-21 seemed an ideal target. Uh, we've been following the IBD story in parallel with the infectious disease story. And, and we felt that even though it was expressed at very low concentrations, it had the potential to have a major impact. We also did some studies with IL-23, since it contributes to the maintenance of, of the TH17 phenotype. The results were not as striking. So we decided, and we generally, uh, with the modeling allows you to pursue several routes in a very inexpensive, cost-effective way. And so you can run several variations of the model or even have some hypothetical reactions that you know is not in the literature, but what's going to happen if I, if I connect this node to that node, how will the overall system change? With IL-23, it was not as successful. IL-21 was more successful, and therefore we decided to then invest experimentally uh, to address further and, and to try to validate that prediction. Yes. I have a question about the therapeutic approach that you're suggesting, that um, antibiotic treatment may not be the best approach because obviously it's a host response that in a chronic state can maintain the inflammation in the gut. Are you suggesting that by blocking IL-21, uh, 21, you reduce the inflammation but then not to eliminate the gut itself? So would it be a combination treatment or would it be just, you know, targeting the inflammation because if you still have the gut, a virulent strain of HD in the, right. in the system, then yeah, obviously we are simplifying the, the story. Can you repeat that question? Yeah, so, so the question is, um, are we proposing, based on the combined experimental and computational work, to address H. pylori infections only by host targeted therapeutics and disregarding uh, antimicrobial treatment, or are you considering a combination? And I think the question, uh, the, the answer is it depends. The, the host pathogen interaction for H. pylori depends on how the host responds, and I think we've demonstrated that uh, in a reproducible way, uh, there's a, an effector response that contributes to tissue damage in a similar way to what you would expect in a, a model of adoptive transfer of colitis, uh, in, in other models that are considered more immune-mediated models, but then there's the bacterium. And there's a variety, a broad range of strains. And obviously, if you have a, a strain that you know for sure it's going to be pathogenic, it's been associated with cancer, uh, you wouldn't want to just deal with the immune response. You would want to deal with, uh, with uh, the bacterium itself. But the reality, if you, if you look at the epidemiology of H. pylori infection worldwide, not in this room. In this room, a small proportion will be infected due to the treatment uh, in, in the Western countries, but if you look worldwide, we have about 85% people infected. We have cancer uh, developing or severe disease in about 10-15%. So what happens with uh, the majority of population uh, is that bug exerting beneficial effects. And if so, by eliminating it, perhaps we are making that population more susceptible to diabetes or to overweight and obesity. And so this, this is, I think, just the uh, research at its infancy. But at some point, when there is enough data, and I would say that there is a need for uh, some clinical testing, uh, the paradigm of treatment may have to be reconsidered for certain strains of H. pylori. Yes. So this actually also, when when Adri was giving the talk about the H. pylori infection model, this also came up, and I was wondering what steps are you taking in order to incorporate more bacteria strains into such a modeling environment? And 
talk about not just interaction of one bacteria, but several bacteria with the immune system and each other. Yeah. So the, the question is, what, what steps are we taking to incorporate additional strains of H. pylori into our modeling and, I guess, experimental Not so much H. pylori as other bacteria. Other, other bacteria. Other bacteria other, yes. other than H. pylori. Yes, that, okay, so let me address the question that I thought you were asking and then I'll address the question that you seem to be asking. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, but uh, on, on the computational modeling, I'm, I'm going to say that we've not been working with one strain, we've been working with a European strain, 26695, SS1, uh, J99, an African strain, and, uh, and so we have a range of parameters that are tweaked depending on the strain. And if you go to the uh, ANISI, the ANISI user interface was designed to be able to account for these strain differences. As to the, the second question, the gastric uh, lamina propria and lumen is very different when compared to the colonic lamina propria. You will have trillions of bacteria in the colonic lamina propria. It's highly populated with uh, perhaps thousand species. In the gastric mucosa, due to the conditions, the acidity and the difficulty of most bacterial strains to survive in that environment, only a very small population of bacteria can be found. And so you may have about 200 species at the most. And H. pylori will be the dominant uh, species. So the situation in terms of um, modeling microbial dynamics in the stomach is not as complex as modeling in the colon. Do we need to model? Possibly yes. We have not done it, and that may be the next steps of uh, our H. pylori modeling work.